Grand rising, everyone. I am so glad to be with you here today on another Sunday in August. Boy, where has time gone? Wow. Um, we are so blessed to have Gina Walker with us here today. Woo! Once a year is not enough, my friend. <laughs> she's, um, not only is she here to be our soloist today, but she's going to be joining us later this afternoon after our fellowship time for a wonderful workshop and um, that is Elevate Your Energy and Praise and Raise Your Soul Frequency. And we will be doing some spiritual practices. We will be balancing our energy and Gina will lead us on a, a wonderful little journey so that we can really live in our bodies from a place of wholeness. So thank you. I hope that you got to stick around for that. It's going to be really great. So this month, we are uh, looking at this whole, um, it's a weird little theme, the unstatus quo, the unstatus quo, where we're, we're kind of turning things upside down. We're looking at things from a different place. We're talking about things on Sunday morning that you wouldn't expect to talk about on um, uh, Sunday morning, and we're tying it all into our um, principles and the things that we teach. And so today, we are talking about um, trauma. Yeah, that's exactly why you came to church on Sunday, I'm sure. <laughs> um, trauma is, is defined as an emotional response to a stressful or um, frightening or distressing event that um, we find difficult to cope with or is out of our control. Now, I venture to say that at some level or another, we've all had some experience of an emotional response to stressful situations that felt out of our control. Absolutely. And when we are at our highest and our best, when those situations come up, we move through them with grace, with ease. We feel our feelings. We let them complete themselves. We uh, process whatever we're going through and we move on. That is the, the highest place that we can be with stressful um, situations and, and events that are difficult. But sometimes, sometimes when we have an experience like that, sometimes it can be very traumatic. and and. Sometimes, instead of dealing with it, we bury it. We cope. I am the queen of coping skills. <laughs> I have a lot of really great coping skills. And yet, what I have found is that in my own experience with the traumas that I have experienced in my life, that those coping mechanisms actually ended, ended up depositing some not um, depositing some experiences and some emotions that were not really for my highest good and they ended up becoming stumbling blocks and obstacles I would find myself not really um, being able to experience the things I wanted to experience and you know in this particular philosophy we teach you how to align your consciousness and your subconscious so that you are co-creators with God, creating an experience that is amazing. And many of you who are practitioners of this teaching, you know what I'm talking about. This ability of ours to really work with consciousness to create our reality in a, in a very real sense, not in a, I'm going to pretend that everything's okay sense. <laughs> and so um, what I have found with trauma is that if we don't deal with it, if, if there's something that comes up and we bury it, it deposits itself in our subconscious. And it gets mixed in with all the other ideas we might, you know, want to hold about abundance and prosperity and, and uh, freedom and power. And when I look at the world around us, when I look at the the, at least this culture that we're living in, in the, in the United States, it, it seems pretty dysfunctional 
to me. And, and it seems like there's a lot of what I'm going to call trauma response going on. Um, there are five common uh, trauma responses that um, you might be familiar with. Uh, those five are fight, flight, and freeze. You've probably heard that before, right? When you're, when you're in a stressful situation, you might find yourself trying to um, fight and get angry so that you can move through it and process it. Sometimes you feel like you have to withdraw and get out of the situation. Sometimes you freeze, you know, you're overwhelmed with the emotion, you don't know what to do. There's two other that I hadn't um, heard of before, and I experienced both of them, and I think they're relevant to what we talked about last week and what I'm going to talk about a little bit more this week, and that's fawn and fine. Fawn and fine. So fawn is where we try to appease or make nice in an effort to stop whatever we're experiencing. Just make it okay. And fine is when we are in downright denial of the impact <laughs> of what we might be experiencing. And, and I have to say, I have, I have probably experienced all five of those. Um, my big ones are fawn, fine, and, and flight. Those are the ones that, that I tend to draw from in, in a traumatic experience. And what I'll say, the other thing I want to say about trauma is that it's, um, it's a little close to home to me. I, I, you know, as I was preparing for today's talk, I thought to myself, do I really want to talk about trauma? You know, it's really something that I have uh, done a lot of work with. You know, I, um, many of you know that I'm in recovery and I started using alcohol and drugs as a child. And um, that was as a result of a traumatic experience that I had. And then when you are drinking and drugging as a child, you create more traumatic experiences because children shouldn't be drinking and drugging. And, and so, you know, I've had quite a bit of experience with this topic. And, and what I find is that I think it's worth talking about because it's a philosophy like this one that really carried me through. Because when I found the Centers for Spiritual Living, when I found Religious Science and Science of Mind, when I found this philosophy, it gave me some agency over my emotions and my thoughts. It taught me how to work with my feelings and my consciousness. It gave me tangible tools where I could begin to process the things that I had been through on a very conscious level. Now, I have done a lot of work um, prior to coming to Science of Mind and this philosophy. I had done holotropic breath work, and I had done some, you know, shamanic healing, and I had uh, uh, and, and some 12-step recovery work with the 12 steps. But it's this philosophy that really, I felt like, gave me the owner's manual to my consciousness. Gave me the ability to begin to work with spiritual practice. And, and not as a way to, at first I thought, I'll, let me back up a minute. At first, it seemed like I could just simply do the spiritual practice, and then I could just, all that stuff in my past didn't, just pretend it didn't exist. <laughs> Let's pray instead. <laughs> um, and I guess I was, it was 2000, yeah, I guess I was about seven or eight years into my path with this philosophy and this teaching. I was getting ready to, um, I was actually just graduated as a minister through the ministerial training. And I was introduced to um, a body of work that did more in-depth spiritual practice. And that in-depth spiritual practice um, involved a process called fear to faith. Um, it involved practices like really finding the places where trauma had caused my wires to get crossed. So that, you know, you, you, you probably had this experience. The metaphor I would use is you stub your toe and you feel like you have to be rushed to the hospital, right? <laughs> and, and you don't know why you're having this exaggerated experience to a situation until at least for me, what I found out was that I had to do a little more digging. I had to, had to do a little more clearing. That's, the, that's really the phrase I want to use because we do teach 
that we're whole, perfect, and complete. And that wholeness and that perfection and that completeness can sometimes get layered by our experiences in life. Sometimes we layer on top that, that pain when we got fired from a job, or that pain from a divorce, or that pain from a medical situation that you didn't expect. And, and we have this layered cake on top of the wholeness, the perfection, and the completeness that we already are. And so when we talk about healing, what we're really talking about is revealing. And I know that um, this isn't everybody's path, but my path has been that I had to get transparent, that I had to clear away what was the obstacles that were in the way. And, and sometimes that clearing required um, transforming an experience, um, having a, having a, creating a new experience through the experience that I've had. And there's a couple of things I want to share with you because um, while trauma is pretty prevalent in our society. I did a little research on this, um, and it, it really became known to the, I'll call the, med the mental health field, when um, our vets were coming back from Vietnam, right? And we had people who were coming back really traumatized by that experience. And, and they were coming, now, now we know that, you know, people were traumatized by the wars before that, but by the time we were into the 70s, we were freer to talk about our experiences and, and, and feel them. We didn't have to disassociate. We didn't have to bury them. And so we began to have a greater understanding of um, what they call post-traumatic syndrome and disorder. And so um, as, as, it has become, as we've become freer, as we've become clearer, as we've become... Uh, a society, if you will, that is freer to speak our mind and feel our feelings and, and do it on Facebook 24-7. <laughs> we, are, we are, a lot of that stuff that's been down in the, you know, the subconscious is bubbling up. It's not really pretty. <laughs> and so what science of mind gives us is an ability to work through this so that we can begin to see what's been hiding out in our subconscious that might be getting in our way. So if you've, you know, if you ever worked with a practitioner or done some, some of the practices in this philosophy and you've really had a deep desire and an embodiment about what you wanted to experience and create and you prayed and you journaled and you worked and it wasn't happening it's likely that there's something in the way, some conflict in consciousness that wants to be cleared. And so that's why we're talking about trauma. And so what is, what is I, I found this wonderful quote from um, Richard Rohr a couple weeks ago. Richard Rohr is, a, I will call him a mystical, new thought, Christian, Franciscan monk. <laughs> <laughs> And he's written a lot of really great books, and if you haven't read any of his material, you might want to check it out. But he writes this about religion and spirituality in relation to this idea around trauma. He says, all great spirituality is about what we do with our pain. If we do not transform our pain, we will transmit it to those around us. I'm going to read it one more time. All great spirituality is about what we do with our pain. If we do not transform our pain, we will transmit it to those around us. Anybody else here transmitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have transmitted my pain onto others, usually family first, right? Because those are the people we feel safest with. Yeah, when we, when we are in pain, if we don't transform it, if we don't, what I'll say is go through it, and get to the other side, well, then it comes up in inappropriate, unlovely moments that aren't necessary. And this path of Centers for Spiritual Living, the path that we teach, is really about clearing away all that that is in the way of our beautiful, authentic nature.
I have two quotes from Ernest Holmes, and I'll, the first one I'll read is um, from early in the Science of Mind textbook. And if you're not familiar with Ernest Holmes, he is the founder of this movement. Um, he was a mystic in his own right. He studied Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy and new thought, you know, he was part of the creation of new thought philosophy. And, um, and he had a lot of um, wonderful ideas that were a synthesis of uh, ancient wisdom. And so he writes about our philosophy and how we move through th things. He says, we are not so cold-blooded as to say to a person with pain that there is no such thing as pain. That is not our idea or our purpose. We admit the fact. It is quite a different thing to admit its necessity. We admit the fact. It's quite a different thing to admit its necessity. So even Ernest Holmes, when he was writing this book in the, in the early 19th century, 20th century, oh, I always get that mixed up. So it's so the 20th century and we're talking about early 1900s. So even, even uh, Ernest Holmes understood that, that we have this human experience. We have this, this thing called being human that we walk through while we're in these beautiful bodies of ours. And so we don't, we can't deny the fact that somebody loses their loved one or that, you know, some tragic medical thing happens in somebody's life. We can't just, you know, I'm not going to walk up to you when you have great loss and say, you're whole perfect and complete with a, you know, with a little saccharine smile on my face. No, we have to, we, we recognize the fact, but then our opportunity, number one, we want to be compassionate, we want to respond with love, we want to be with someone, and at the same time, we can know that it's a temporary situation. Most of us in this room, I'm looking around the room, most of this room, of us in this room have been through difficult, or maybe even tragic circumstances and gotten to the other side. We know that is part of this thing called life. And so while we can be compassionate with each other and while we can respond with love and when people are experiencing trauma, it's important not to do what, I, I kind of mentioned this last week, a spiritual bypass. And a spiritual bypass means that I want to um, I'm just going to pray for you. you. You tell me something that's really tragic and, and, and it's filled with pain and trauma, and I say, okay, I'll pray for you. I know you're whole perfectly complete. There's a time for that. There's absolutely a time for that, but it isn't at the moment of the incident. And so I think as, as and, and I think as our movement, this philosophy, this beautiful philosophy of Centers for Spiritual Living evolves, we're learning. We're learning how to be present with what's happening before us to, to really honor the human experience. And then when the, when the person is ready or when you're ready, to have tools to transform that experience. And so when we look at this idea of trauma, I think it's important that we begin to understand that it's, it's, it's really tempting to not want to deal with it. I, re I, I remember when um, many years ago my daughter was, um, she was entering the phase of knew knowing that her husband and her relationship was over. And she was entering that phase of getting ready to, to split up and she was absolutely heartbroken know what I did? I took her to the movies. I, were, I, I gave her a lot of compassion later, you know. We, we worked through things together. I supported her. But at the time, I was unequipped to deal with her pain. And so I had to bypass it. I had to distract her because her pain was too great for me to hold. And I, I imagine we all have experiences like that when somebody is in great pain and we don't know how to hold it. There's no shame in being unskilled. There's no shame in being unskilled at dealing with the difficult things in life. 
But I want to encourage you to allow love to lead you. You know, I, I, I held her when she cried, and I held her hand while she walked through that divorce, but there was a moment when her emotions were so out of control and I didn't know what to do. And, and that's just the, the experience when someone is moving through trauma, that, that it is ours to try to find a way to be present with them, to not bypass it. Our, our human race has been experiencing trauma for eons. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, I'm running over. If we, <laughs> if you look at the, um, the trajectory of the human race and civilization, and you look at how we treated human beings in the I don't know, the, the Hildegard, you read from Hildegard today in the, ele, you know, in the 1100s, in the 1500s, when I was reading some, a piece from Julian Norwich. And she was a saint that was um, really prevalent in the 15th century. And her, she had an experience of great loss. She was alive during um, a plague. She lost everyone in her family. She became very sick and she was on her deathbed. And for her, as she dealt with this great pain and tragedy, she also leaned on her faith. She leaned on the faith that there was, there was something greater than her that could support her. Now in that time in civilization, when, uh, a very traumatic time in our, in our civilization's history, there was, um, you know, religion was pretty oppressive, right? It was all about sin and the following instructions and um, a pathway to um, enlightenment that came through power over us rather than power to us. And, and in that moment, as she was in that great deal of pain, she leaned on her, on her spirituality and she found a power within her that was not taught to her. It was not the teaching that she was taught during that time. She was, you know, at that time, the Catholic Church was very, we had the Inquisition. And instead, what the, the, the inspiration, the enlightenment that came to her was that there was a God that was so good and gentle that we could never be separate from it. So when we're moving through pain, our opportunity is to transform it. And I think it requires us to lean in a little, to begin to see what is underneath this. What is, what, how is, perhaps this is something that needs to break up. Perhaps there's something that I'm moving through that, that I need to let go of. Perhaps there's something I need to embrace. Our traumas, our difficulties, are always opportunities for us to express in a greater way. And right now, um, right now in our culture, there's a, there's a lot of discord. We have, you know, a, a, a oppression and repression and people are standing up and saying it's not okay. We have political discord where people are shaming and blaming all of it creates, um, I'll, I'll say it creates trauma for us as we, have to, as we move through it. And so our opportunity is to use our spiritual practices to, I don't want to say um, make it go away, really we use those spiritual practices to integrate and transcend. Integrate and transcend. What is, what is it I'm learning? What is it that I I'm, I'm need to integrate? What is it that where my eyes need to open up more? And so my in invitation to you, if we look at this Trauma 101 and we look at our spiritual practices, is to find that spiritual practice that you can engage. It might be um, journaling, it might be contemplation, it might be chanting, it might be meditation, it might be spiritual mind treatment, it might be taking classes. Look for that spiritual practice where you can stay conscious 
to what it is that needs to be released, moved through, transcended, and integrated. We are, um, we are a teaching that's evolving. And for many, many years, it was, it was all about our own personal healing. And, and it is time to take those tools out into the world. We have this beautiful vision of a world that works for everyone. And we have to transcend and evolve past a world that works for me and a world that works for you that a world to a world that works for all. And part of that is to be present with our own trauma. Part of it is to be present with the trauma of others, not to swim in it or to, to uh, overindulge in our feelings, but to see what it is that we want to transform, to see what it is that is ready to shift so that we really can live in a world that works for everyone. Thank you very much. So we do do a practice called uh, spiritual mind treatment and affirmative prayer. That is a, a prayer that helps to align us with a, like Julianne Norwich did, that align us with that divine intelligence that is always available to us. And so join me, if you will, I invite you to close your eyes as I, as I speak this prayer, knowing that there is a divinity inherent in all life. That divinity is not separate and apart from humanity. It is all of humanity. It is all that I am. It is all that each one is. There is no way we could be separated from this one infinite reality. And so I know as we step into this bigger idea of transforming our stepping stones, transforming our stumbling blocks into stepping stones, I know that we are sourced. We are sourced by the thing that makes the grass grow, the energy and the power of the divine love that wants to experience life in its fullest by means of each one. So I know wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, we do this with compassion, whether it is our own pain or whether it is the pain of another or whether it is generational pain, we trust that there is a power and a presence that wants to move in, as, and through our whole being so that we may be the clearest channels of love and peace and freedom. And so we lean in. We allow ourselves to be sourced. We do our spiritual practice. And we respond with love. And it is from this powerful place that I know that we begin to realize this beautiful vision of a world that works for all. I know that it can work for each one and that we can lift each other up as we walk out this thing called being human. And it is with gratitude that I speak this word and I know this highest truth. I trust that each one is sourced, that each one is supported that each one has that avenue to a greater good in this now moment. And so I simply release this and I let it go. And together we say, and so it is.